Okay, well, I see it is 12 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. And um, I'd like to start by uh, just introducing myself. Uh, my name is Kelly Jo Woodside. I'm one of the consultants at the Massachusetts Library System, and I'm our staff coordinator for today's program. For those who are from out of state or otherwise unfamiliar with our organization, the Massachusetts Library System, or MLS as we may refer to it, is a state-supported nonprofit collaborative that fosters cooperation, communication, innovation, and sharing among member libraries of all types across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we currently have about 1,600 member libraries. Uh, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items with you due to the large number of attendees. Uh, all attendees will be on mute for the duration of the program. However, we do encourage questions, so please use the, uh, the chat or questions box in the control panel to uh, just type in your questions. You can do that at any point. Our uh, presenter today has built in a couple of stops during his program where we will relay questions to him verbally. So feel free to type those in at any point and we will uh, get those over to Charlie. And if you have any technical difficulties, you can uh, type those in there as well and one of the MLS staff will assist you. Uh, today's session is being recorded and we will send a follow-up email with a link to the recording and some additional resources for you uh, within a few days. It may take um, three or four days, but we'll get that out to you. Okay, so with that out of the way, I wanna go ahead and move into today's program. On behalf of MLS, I'm very pleased to welcome Charlie Remy, who will be presenting his talk, Autistics in the Library, How Libraries Can More Effectively Serve Patrons and Employees on the Spectrum. Charlie is the Electronic Resources and Serials Librarian and Associate Professor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga Library. He has an MS LIS from Simmons College and a BA in Spanish and Gender Studies from Elon University. His hobbies include keeping up with the news, speaking Spanish, walking, hiking, and world travel. Charlie was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome on the autism spectrum at the age of 23. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to him. So welcome, Charlie, over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you all for taking the time to listen, whether it's live right now or in the future via the recording. Um, my goal is really to provide a mix of personal anecdotes along with practical suggestions for all library types. So whether you're public, academic, special, or school, I'm trying to make this applicable to as many different library types as possible. And these suggestions would not only benefit autistics, but also all patrons in general, I believe. And that's something that's called universal design. Um, I want to start the uh, presentation with just a little uh, note about language. I understand that there have been some questions about my choice of the word autistic in my webinar title. Some people believe person with autism is more respectful, and I can see where they're coming from. People's identities are, are complex and go far beyond their diagnoses. At the same time, many in the autism community prefer the term autistic or identity first language because they believe autism is a core part of who they are as people. I'm including a link to a blog, several, a blog post and a couple articles about this in the LibGuide with recommended resources and we will send that out to you later um, with the recording. Personally, I'm okay with either term, and I actually just noticed that I use kind of both terms in my title, one autistics and then um, patrons and employees on the spectrum. Um, to me, what's more important than a label is how one is actually treated by others on a daily basis and others' concrete actions toward them, such as respect, autonomy, and empowerment. We may differ on how to say things, but it's my sincere hope that the content of this presentation will be helpful and practical to everyone here today and watching the recording in the future. So I wanna give some contextual information about why the autistic community matters. Um, according to the CDC, one in 59 children are on the are, are on the autism spectrum. 
The reality, as you know, is that autistic children grow up and become adults, and therefore their needs evolve as they age. Unfortunately, only about 14% of those on the spectrum have paid employment, according to a Drexel University study. And many are underemployed and are therefore not contributing to society at their fullest potential, but they might, they may likely have a real strong desire to be fully employed. Uh, the American Library Association Code of Ethics has several, I think, relevant parts to it that I wanted to just point out uh, for this presentation. Um, serving all patrons, providing equitable access, protecting rights and welfare of all library employees, and encourage those interested in the profession. So again, these points cover both patrons and employees of libraries. So I wanna uh, now move to common outward characteristics. And before I mention them, I wanna just say how it imp important it is to avoid overgeneralizing. Characteristics, strengths, and challenges are highly individualized and subject to um, the individual and their context. There's, a, there's kind of a saying in the autism community that when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. A, a single person, uh, individual, does not define the experience for everybody with autism. That having been said, some common outward characteristics include lack of eye contact, monologues about special interests, and special interests are really subjects that really, really interest individuals. I mean, it could be, you know, video games, it could be trains, it could be, you know, whatever. And they become, we become experts on these topics and um, have a lot of enthusiasm toward them. Uh, fine and gross motor challenges, um, rocking, flapping hands, and fidgeting, as well as some challenges with self-care like grooming. There are then some more subtle characteristics that have more to do with uh, personality traits, I think, um, such as being very honest, um, preferring routine, being detail-oriented, having an intense focus on a task, especially if it has to do with uh, special interests, and um, subtle nonverbal social cues can be challenging. Unwritten, unwritten language. Other uh, subtle characteristics include high anxiety and becoming easily overwhelmed. It can be challenging to understand others' perspectives, but I would argue that this does not mean a lack of empathy. It's maybe not perceiving the other person's uh, perspective right away, but once it's, it's um, told in a clearer way to the individual, then I, I would think in many cases they would be very empathetic to them. Um, difficulty with planning and completing tasks and sensory sensitivities like loud noises, food textures, and flickering lights. Now, I want to mention that some individuals with autism may appear neurotypical or non-autistic. That's a term for someone who's non-autistic is neurotypical. Um, because they don't manifest as many obvious characteristics. And this is very true in my individual case. But nevertheless, we face many challenges. And this kind of invisibility can lead to others developing unrealistic expectations, the need to justify a diagnosis to others, or react to people minimizing it, like saying, 
oh, I would have never known you had Asperger's. <clears throat> Um, and I realize that many people's intentions are, are, are good and they're not trying to be rude or hurtful. That's just kind of how they process it. Um, but, you know, first impressions can really be inaccurate. And my request is that you please get to know us as an individual and our unique characteristics before judging us. Neurodiversity has been something that's um, recently gotten a lot of attention in the past five to 10 years. And it's a, this ASCD um, publication defines it as neurological differences which are seen as human variations that we should embrace and respect. And uh, neurodiversity, in addition to autism, includes learning and intellectual disabilities, ADD, ADHD, and social and emotional disorders. So it's a kind of a broad umbrella term. Um, and as see, instead of seeing it as a negative or a deficit, a medicalized deficit, um, it, it, it sees them as unique and positive traits that can, um, ha can have helped the person contribute in a unique way to society. So I want to um, pause for about five minutes, um, if necessary, for questions from the audience. And Kelly is monitoring the chat for any questions. Okay, yes, so if you have questions, go ahead and type those in for us and we'll get those over to Charlie. Uh, let me give you just a moment to do that. Uh, we have one person asking, can you show the slide of common outward appearances again, please? Oh, sure. Um, and this is not an exhaustive uh, list. This is just kind of my own experience uh, off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't want you at all to think that this is an exhaustive list. Uh, there, there are uh, some resources in the LibGuide, um, such as Tony Atwood's Asperger Syndrome book, um, that that provide more uh, detail as well as some autobiographical books about people's individual experiences. Okay, uh, so Charlie, another person's wondering if you'll be touching upon Tourette's at any point today? No, um, I, to be honest, I know very little about Tourette's, but I think that would be definitely consider, fall under neurodiversity. Okay. Another person's asking, can you say more about the use of the word disorder in the last slide? Yeah, that was something that I took from the, um, that was something that I took from the publication. Um, I didn't know really, I, I agree, disorder has a negative, it, it's a, it tends to be a medical term and it has a negative connotation to it. Um, so perhaps, you know, social and emotional differences or challenges, um, that might be a better way to, to frame it. Um, but I was at the time, I didn't, I was like, well, I didn't really know a better way to say it. Okay, we have another person, Charlie, who's wondering, do you have any thoughts on how our standards around social behaviors in interviews can be challenging for neurodiverse library workers? Uh, I yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna so. go into that um, uh, later in the presentation. And so if you could just jot down any questions you might have um, when I discuss that and ask them at the end, that would be great. Yep. We'll hold that um, for a little bit later. Uh, someone's asking, will we send copies of the slides? Yes, we will. We'll take care of that uh, here at MLS. Um, someone's asking, what's the difference between Asperger's and autism? Well, um, the, the diagnosis manual was changed a couple years ago by the American Psychiatric Association. And I believe technically, and I'm not an expert on the 
on the whole diagnosis details. But my understanding is that Asperger's is no longer a diagnosis uh, in and of itself uh, as part of the DSM-5 manual. It is a, uh, it falls under autism spectrum. So that, that's my understanding, but if anybody um, knows differently, please correct me. But okay. the, the, the DSM-5 came out several years after I was diagnosed, so. Okay, uh, we have another person wondering if autism is more common for a certain gender or ethnicity. Mm, I, th I don't think so. I think what is, uh, would, I think what the difference is, is the prevalence and diagnoses. My understanding, I think, I think males tend to be diagnosed more often, but there are females who definitely have it uh, and are not necessarily seen as having it because their characteristics might be more subtle. So I really do think that it, it really is um, based on diagnoses and awareness and access to resources to be diagnosed um, uh, rather than uh, the gender of or race of an individual. Okay, another person is uh, is asking about alarms. So she says, we have regular fire alarm and notification mm. system testing several times during the year. This yeah. means loud noises, flashing lights, and repeated yeah. speaker messages. Uh, mm -hmm. They can't obviously stop this process. So is there something they can do that might help any autistic patrons? Who may yeah, I would, I would, if there's any way that you could maybe give everybody a heads up if you know that it's going to happen in advance, um, that would be helpful, maybe do an announcement on the PA system or whatever. But yes, personally, I am very bothered by sudden startling noises, um, like sirens, like um, when our announcement system goes on, it makes a really loud um, kind of bell ringing sound. And that's just when I'm focused on something or even the phone suddenly ringing, it's just very, um, discomforting. Um, so yeah, if you could maybe give people a little bit of advanced warning if that's possible so they can make, um, you know, their own arrangements, uh, that might be good. Okay. And we have just two more questions for this round. Uh, one is um, someone's asking if you know the term uh, autism spectrum condition, which might be an alternative to uh, to the disorder. Yeah, it's interesting you mention that because I um, I saw that actually listed on a publisher's website. Jessica Kingsley is a UK publisher, and they actually use that word autism condition. Um, to me, in my opinion, condition is very similar to disorder. It's medicalized. It has a negative connotation to it. So, I mean, I would probably personally not tend to not use it. Um, and, but I mean, it, if it's used, I mean, I'm, I probably wouldn't correct someone because that is the technical term, but um, it's, Disorder. I try to avoid using medicalized language uh, because it's just it's it's too negative and it's too disempowering. Okay. Um, another question uh, about patrons in the library. Would you consider a patron who asks the same question uh, over again, over and over again, um, even though he or she might know the answer? Would you consider that to be someone who might fall under the autism? Spectrum? Yes, I, I would. I would. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, it could be um, that they 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 need that reassurance. They could be second guessing themselves. People with autism um, like to follow rules. And so 
Um, if it's about a rule or a policy, they might be checking to make sure that they are um, following the correct rule. Um, they could have, they could have um, uh, memory, like recall uh, challenges and not be able to, to adequately uh, remember something. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing it might be anxiety related and wanting to, wanting that confirmation. I know with myself, um, I also have obsessive compulsive disorder. I was diagnosed with that in middle school and I um, need a lot of uh, reassurance and um, I, I tend to second guess myself a lot. So um, I'm, I'm, that's just a guess on my part without knowing the specifics of the situation and the individual, I can't you know, give a definitive answer, but my, my, and my thought would be it's possible. Yeah. Okay. And just one quick comment before we go back to your presentation, Charlie, we had another uh, person write in to mention those sudden noises uh, that we talked about are also distressing for people with other neurological oh, conditions, yes. such as Lyme, yeah. chronic fatigue and dementia. So informing the public yeah. ahead uh, would help many is another example of that universal design. Universal design. design. Yep. Yep. About. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's the end of our questions for now, so you can resume. All right, so um, let's see, back. All right, so um, as I mentioned, I, I wanna uh, share uh, some a few personal experiences in each section, uh, just with the hope that it's um, kind of, sometimes stories illustrate things better than, than you know, uh, just a, a list of, of facts. Um, so my parents began bringing me to the library at an early age, and it really cultivated in me a love and respect for lifelong learning. And it also satisfied my intellectual curiosity. I've always been a very curious person, and I've always asked a lot of questions. Um, I also meant met a lot of nice people and including mentors and when i say people now that i think about it um it's more so adults than uh than peers my age because when i was young and i think this is a is a common characteristic of of autistics is that um we are out of sync with our our chronological age and so we might have trouble identifying and having com finding commonalities with our peers because we're just we have different interests and um i actually learned how to use the internet in my public library in 1995. um <clears throat> so some interpersonal suggestions for librarians um working with um autistic patrons um is to be patient um, expect lots of questions. I think it's a curiosity, but it also could be, um, you know, the need for uh, affirmation and validation that they understand things correctly. Um, setting clear boundaries is really important. If you feel like your time or attention is being monopolized, um, I don't think that it's intentional that the autistic individual wants to necessarily monopolize your time. But again, this is about the, this goes back to perspective taking. They might not be aware that you have other things to do and other people to help and it becomes a service quality and equity issue. If you're talking with them during most of your shift, uh, what other people are there who aren't getting the help that they need. So setting the clear boundaries and saying, you know, I really have to, um, you know, I've, I really have to talk, uh, do work with someone else, help someone else. Um, I enjoy talking with you, but I just have other things that I need to do and just being really honest about it. Um, explaining the why for rules, we tend to think very logically about things. And so saying, well, just because doesn't really, isn't really an adequate explanation. Um, definitely treat us as equals. Please don't talk down or patronize us. I can tell, you know, when, when sometimes when people do that and it's just, it's very disempowering. Um, 
talk to us as a as a peer, as an equal. Um, and intervene if you see um, the person becoming a target of bullies, um, as you probably would with anybody, uh, but particularly um, with uh, many, uh, and I say this from personal experience, when, when you have characteristics that are unique, um, you tend to draw more attention to yourself and become vulnerable to uh, bullying. And so just be aware of that. And if you see that starting to happen, uh, please address it as quickly as possible. Um, as I said before, be direct and provide clear step-by-step -step directions. Um, so some physical environment suggestions. Um, offer spaces with minimal sensory stimulation that are quiet, uh, don't have flickering lights and have different kinds of seating. I realize that you, there are, in many situations, there's not much you can do depending on your uh, facility and its limitations. So in an ideal world, you would have, you know, areas that are uh, kind of quiet zones, but that's not possible in all libraries due to size and design. So, um, and I, I understand that. Um, Another uh, suggestion would be to provide earplugs, headphones, and sunglasses. Um, I survived undergrad and graduate school with earplugs. I just, they are, uh, they helped um, me control my uh, sensory input and reduced a lot of anxiety. Some collection suggestions I wanted to mention. Purchase more materials authored or created by, by autistics. We really are the experts on our own experience and it's important that our voices be heard. Um, create website guides for autism and related resources. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, Jessica Kingsley is a UK publisher that publishes a lot in this area, a lot of really good books. Um, so some programming suggestions, um, offering quiet hours. I've noticed that many stores and tourist sites like museums and grocery stores and that type of thing have started to do this. And it's like setting aside a certain time each week um, for uh, uh, quiet hours where um, it, it's not as overwhelming sensorily. Um, and also, um, teaching young adults how to safely navigate social media platforms and their corresponding social rules. I recently attended a presentation on this topic at an adult autism conference, and it made me think that this would be a perfect opportunity um, for libraries to get involved and, and really teach uh, the young adults on the spectrum some positive uh, proactive practical skills. Um, maybe offering gaming and anime groups. These are popular interests among autistics. Um, and encourage autism acceptance and neurodiversity during the month of April. Um, some community partnership suggestions where I think both the libraries and the community organizations could both benefit would be uh, providing autism groups with information resources and then also inviting them to do presentations for library staff development as well as the community in general. Um, partnering with employment agencies uh, where they might be able to provide an overview of local autism-friendly job opportunities, resume and cover letter review, and mock job interviews. Um, and then many schools and universities uh, now have programs to support students on the spectrum. Um, now, any more questions? Okay, so again, if you have some questions, um, go ahead and type those in. Uh, someone wanted to suggest some collection development resources for, for children's books. Um, yeah. Disabilityinkidlit.com, and we can add these to yeah, the Yeah, that would be great. That's, 
Uh, yeah. So we'll add those in. Thank you yep. for your suggestions. And uh, a novelmind.com. So um, disability and kid lit and a novelmind.com. Uh, someone is asking if a patron on the spectrum is having a strong response to other patrons action or over stimulus, what can we do with the patron and other patrons to alleviate the situation? If it's a strong response to, oh, like noisy patrons, I guess. Um, yeah, I would, I would um, maybe take that the autistic individual aside and just, um, you know, ask them what's, what's kind of upsetting them. And, um, you know, if it is the noise level, then, um, you know, obviously go to the um, individual who's making that noise and just explain that it's being very disruptive to to people and um, you know it, it it could very well be bothering neurotypicals in the library and what I have noticed is that it's very interesting how much people in general will tolerate without saying anything and then when someone does say something, they'll come up to you and say, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I'm so glad you took care of that. I was experiencing the same level of annoyance. So um, the autistic individual could actually be speaking on behalf of other people who are annoyed. And I think one of our gifts as uh, being on the spectrum is we are not as um, concerned about uh, social rules. They're not at the forefront of our head. So we will often say things that be very, again, very honest about things and we'll say things um, that that others might might not say despite feeling the same level of discomfort. Okay, thank you. Uh, another person's mentioning another resource, Neurodivergent Narwhals, which is from a library in Western Washington State. We're gonna add all of these resources to yeah. the LibGuide and get those out. Thanks for sharing those. Um, one of the things we, we had hoped to do is to actually ask if anyone had resources to share. So thank you for that. Uh, I have another one person asking, uh, what is the best way to reach out to the autism community? Uh, that, that is um, how to market programs and services. Um, I would just, you know, I think it's um, highly dependent on what is available in where you live. Um, you know, different areas and are, you know, are rural or urban, um, there, there may or may not be an autism center uh, in your town. It might be a little far away, depending, again, and depending on the context, but uh, I would, um, I would just start with the Google search. Uh, I would also uh, talk with parents because um, many parents I'm sure would be uh, aware of uh, the resources that exist in that community for autism. Okay. And then, you know, and then have a meeting with the, with the, with the folks at, at that organization and, and see, you know, kind of what, what, what are their needs? What are your needs? How can you work together? Okay. Uh, someone else is asking, um, I appreciate that a patron's developmental age does not always match their chronological age. Yeah. What do you do if the patron wants to attend a program that is for younger children? Well, I'm not a children's, I, that is kind of out of my bailiwick. Um, so I'm not a YA or children's librarian. So I, I really I don't know what to say. I mean, I think it really depends on the individual, where they are at uh, developmentally and, you know, understanding why, maybe talking with their parents. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would try to find out as much information as I can before, you know, making a decision with that. Okay. Uh, someone's asking again for the name of the publisher in the UK, Charlie. Jessica Kingsley. Okay. K I N G S L E Y, um, and and there's going to be a link to them on our LibGuide. Uh, someone else is asking if you know of any examples of libraries with good quiet time established. 
Sure. Uh, do a Google News search because what I do, and I, I'm, I don't know if any libraries have done this, but I subscribe to Google News alerts every day, and um, for one is for Aspergers and another is for autism, and I just keep seeing these stores and museums that are having these uh, quiet hours. So. Um, it's possible that libraries have started to do it too. Okay. So just search uh, the go on Google. Just uh, do a search and then click on the news tab, um, and and hopefully you'll find some news articles if it if it's been done. Okay. Uh, there there was an article in the Smithsonian about museum Smithsonian Magazine about museums. I can try to find that. I just found it the other day, and let me just write that down, um, Smithsonian Magazine, and we can add that to the LibGuide. Uh, I, I think I've asked Kelly to add like six different yes. things to the LibGuide today, so it keeps growing, which is good. We will keep adding for sure. Uh, just a couple more questions before we, we move on again, Charlie. Uh, one more. Um, I have some volunteers in my department um, oh, actually, uh, we're going to hold this question. Uh, this is a question about volunteers, and I think that will fall under. You're going to talk about yes, uh, staff. employment. So we'll, yep, yep, we'll hold yep. that question. Uh, someone Great. asked if you have strategies for patrons with alexithemia. Alexithemia. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, which is uh, that is not every autistic person is aware of their emotional state, what they're feeling, and etc. Uh, reading our oh, own emotions a... and feelings can be difficult. So. Yeah, that's a that's a new term. Uh, I have not heard that before. Um, hmm. I I think um, I mean that that might be actually a, a workshop that you all and at the library could provide. Um, maybe partner with a local autism um, a center or a, a psychologist or social worker. Um, you know that that might be. Uh, an area of of you know social skills that could be um, you know beneficial to offer a workshop on and have it be really practical. Just a thought. Great. Okay, I'll, I'll give you one but more. There's question. not a really quick answer for that. You know, I mean, it takes a lot of time and work and uh, on on all sides. So so um, it's not something that can be you know um, uh, developed quickly. Okay. One more quick uh, uh, practical question. Can a certain type of seating, like soft versus hard seating, make a difference with sensory stimulation? Yeah, I think so. Um, personally, I would just offer more uh, variety uh, if possible. So, you know, um, because I think it's highly dependent on the individual. So giving just more uh, choices, um, really soft versus more upright and, um, you know, traditional um, would be good. Okay, so let's move back into your presentation. Uh, we've got a few more questions, okay. which we'll get Great. to at the end. Okay, so now I want to talk about librarianship as a career. Um, and starting off with my personal experience, the library was central to my undergraduate experience. As Kelly said, I went to Elon in North Carolina. Um, the library was a, a very comfortable place to study and spend free time. It was called Belk Library, and the students nicknamed it Club Belk. Um, for me, it was an area of socialization where I had more in common with the adult librarians than my peers, and it filled a social need. And the librarians listened and provided advice, career, personal. It was just, it, they were just very helpful to me. And the staff were also very service oriented. Um, and that, that was, you know, the tone was set by the dean. Um, and uh, everybody was just, they were so helpful. And I really looked up to them as role models. My collection suggestions were taken seriously. At the time, there was an initiative to shelter a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. Uh, and the library um, had to reach a certain number of volumes uh, in order to apply for this uh, honor society chapter. And so they had a lot of resources to add new books. And so I constantly 
um, made suggestions and, and they bought them, you know? Um, and so it really, the overall experience combined with my childhood, uh, frequently going to libraries really, um, inspired me to pursue a career in librarianship and everyone there seemed very content with their work for me libraries are a good fit because i love information and learning i enjoy working in higher education and it's very gratifying for me to be able to help people obtain the information that they need so some suggestions um, I would really proactively encourage those who seem to enjoy being in the library to consider the profession, maybe allow them to spend a few hours job shadowing in different parts of the library like circulation, collections, children, adult, um, and provide maybe informal mentoring. Be candid about the educational requirements, job prospects, the pros and cons of the work you do. Um, offer paid internships to students in, enrolled in library school. And also um, consider neurodiverse post MLS residencies that are paid. This would provide uh, you know, this would usually be for a year or two. Um, it would provide work experience, which is critical to gaining professional employment. It, you could uh, introduce them to different areas of the library um, and, you know, have them do complete real world projects um, to demonstrate their skill and value and put it on a resume. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, for actual employees, um, you know, I disclosed in my case, um, I disclosed my Asperger's um, when I received a job offer um, for uh, a schedule accommodation. I asked for a schedule accommodation for 10 hour days. Um, it provides a really good work life balance for me and it's time for me to physically and mentally recharge having uh, three consecutive days off. Um, and so when I asked for that, um, I explained why, because I have Asperger's and, and this has really worked well for me. Um, and and that was uh, that accommodation was made and it, it really works well and I'm very thankful for it. Um, my coworkers are um, very supportive and accept me and my quirks, um, my need for clear directions and structure. I ask a lot of questions for clarification. I'm anxious and easily overwhelmed. Um, and my office door is always closed to keep the noise out, but they know that they can come in at any time and talk with me. Um, my supervisor is really patient. And I hope overall that my uh, presence has helped my colleagues become, become more familiar with autism and what we can offer to libraries. Um, also, I wanted to mention that I've, I've been on the advisory board for a few years of uh, the Mosaic program, which is a uh, program to support autistic students here at UTC. Um, and it's a, um, you know, these students are, are pursuing um, regular degrees across all areas, and this is just providing them with some um, structure, and uh, they have a curriculum that they've um, uh, published, and they um, have mandatory study hall and uh, academic coaching and peer mentors. So those are the four components of the program, and it's just been great to see it evolve over the years. Um, and some suggestions uh, regarding the interview process. Um, this is kind of what someone was asking about, I believe, before. Um, try to condense meetings and avoid redundancies when possible. Uh, provide uh, breaks. Um, and give the individual the opportunity to, de de to demonstrate their skills and knowledge. So real world exercises and prompts that are directly related to the job that they're applying for and focus on practical situations. I suggest trying to overlook irrelevant social challenges and quirks, especially if the position is not in public services. They, they, they might not be need, have the need to interact with the public if it's like a, 
uh, collections position tech services. Um, so if you're concerned about how patrons might react to that, um, those quirks, uh, it might not really be important depending on the job. Um, and again, these suggestions could benefit all interviewees, universal design. Um, I, I included this book uh, in the LibGuide called Six Word Lessons for Autism-Friendly Workspaces um, because they have a lot of practical uh, suggestions related to interviews. So that might be uh, a good resource. Um, Disclosure truly is up to the individual. Um, it really revolves around their level of trust and comfort with the environment and the people. And um, so you, you just, you have to respect that. Um, based on my own experience, I wanted to share some suggestions for fostering success over the long term because I think it's not only important to hire autistic library employees, but to retain them over the long term. And I've heard in general, I don't know what the statistics are, but a lot of people, um, for various reasons, a lot of people on the spectrum just end up not uh, being able to retain their jobs. Um, for for a variety of reasons. And so trying to proactively work um, after hiring the individual, um, work on fostering success is really, really as important as hiring them because you want them to succeed and grow. So having candid conversations about, you know, um, their contributions, um, and areas needing improvement. I think if you balance the areas needing improvement with the with the mention of their contributions and their value, that's really nice because it 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 helps uh, validate them. Um, providing, as I said earlier, clear and step by step instructions, patience, um, and just listening and advising. You know, I personally always I I frequently like to ask people for their opinion on something. Um, and and just being there to listen and provide advice. Um, a quiet workspace um, with minimal distractions, ideally an office with a door, although, as I said earlier, not all library buildings are, are designed this way. Um, I think it's really, really important, um, and I, I really wanna highlight this, balancing support with challenges to enable growth. So one of the things that that I am very fortunate um, to, to have in my work environment is a supervisor who supports me and understands me, but also challenges me so I continue growing. And when you provide only support, but no challenges, the individual will uh, most likely stagnate and not continue to grow and evolve. And it might be comfortable for them, but in the long run, um, you're limiting their uh, ability uh, to take positive risks and, and grow and evolve. And I can I can say that from my own experience, it's important to, on the one hand, know I'm supported and understood and valued, but on the other hand, um, given challenges, you know, um, given things that, that I might at the beginning not be comfortable um, doing, like leading a portion of a project. I wouldn't have, you know, raised my hand to do that, but, um, but I grew as a result of taking on that responsibility. Um, and then also having trusted colleagues to help decode social nuances. So, oh, what did that person mean? I, I'm thinking they meant this, is that correct? Um, so just navigating the subtleties, social subtleties of the work environment. And I can't tell you how many times I'm so glad I asked because I would have, you know, 
it, it might have been they could have been using sarcasm or they could have been, you know, um, non-verbally trying to subtly, um, you know, um, uh, talk about something non-verbally. Can't think of the word right now. And and so um, it's it's very helpful when you have trusted colleagues to ask about that, um, who can who can um, kind of uh, help you. Um, so in conclusion. I believe that libraries are often a great fit for autistics. As patrons, we can cultivate our special interests by you know, taking advantage of all the great uh, resources that are offered in various formats. We can socialize and also obtain resources for improved quality of life. And as employees, we can contribute to society in meaningful ways, perform work that's often detail-oriented, achieve economic independence, and as a result, have higher self-esteem. My future hopes include providing a wider variety of services for autistics of all ages, instead of focusing primarily on kids. Kids are a very important area, um, and, and I'm not minimizing that, but they should not be the sole focus of autistic-related collections and programming, because the kids grow up. Um, and uh, collecting more materials produced by autistics ourselves. Um, and I'm hoping the profession becomes more, the library profession becomes more neurodiverse by hiring and retaining autistic employees. Um, as we've referred to several times, um, Kelly and I have developed the LibGuide and we'll be adding to it. Thank you for your uh, many suggestions. Um, and um, the link will be sent out uh, in the in the with the link to the recording. Um, I also um, before I open it up to questions, um, I wanted to mention uh, to keep the conversation going, and I have a link to this on the LibGuide as well. But I created a couple years ago uh, a Facebook group called Autistics and Libraries and Their Allies, and um, it's a way for people to share news, ask questions, kind of like a, a version of uh, a listserv, but on social media. Um, and it's a private group uh, and I, I moderate it. And so if you're interested in continuing the conversation and you're on Facebook, I would, I would love it if you would join. We currently have about 140 people. Uh, and to me, it's not the number of people that matters, but it's more the conversation. So I'm hoping that in the future, there, there will be more organic uh, conversation um, and it won't be all driven mostly by me posting articles. Um, and, and there is has been some organic conversation, but it, it hasn't been as frequent as I'd like. So. Um, and I am going to turn on my webcam for the question and answer uh, session. So um, hopefully you all can see me and uh, let's get to some questions. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have quite a few questions. So um, excuse me just one moment. If I'm not able to get to everyone's, um, definitely I would encourage you to participate in Charlie's Facebook group. But let's go back and take a look at some of the questions we had earlier about uh, employment. Yes. Someone was asking, um, he's got some volunteers in his department who fall on the spectrum. What sorts of accommodations and especially tasks would you recommend uh, that he might provide for those volunteers? Yeah, I mean, it's really dependent upon the individual. Without knowing them and what their strengths and challenges are, um, you know, I don't know if they have, you know, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of assumptions that are made. Um, so, you know, oftentimes it's assumed, oh, well, will give them low level repetitive work. Uh, that might work for some, but it might be very boring to others. 
um, like, you know, so I, it, it depends on what their skill is, how old they are, what their uh, education is. Are they, do they have computer expertise? Are they really creative? You know, not, not, every, not everyone who's autistic is a coder. That's the other thing that I want to say. Like people, people uh, on the spectrum, some might, might be coders. Other people uh, might be creative writers or artists. I mean, it's, it, it is everything. So, you know, really without knowing the specifics of, of the individual, um, I, I, I couldn't say specific tasks. Okay. And you may have answered this, but I'm going to go ahead and, and ask the question as it was written. So how can yep. we support, uh, what, how can we support employees on the spectrum? And then any tips on how to build a team? Tips on how to build a team. Maybe how to integrate. Oh yeah. Yeah. Team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's important to I'm thinking about like again it's dependent upon the individual but the individual may have a preference it's possible for more independent work because socializing can be so challenging and exhausting so I think it depends on the individual and how comfortable and easy it is for them to work with others. And I think one of the good things that one of the things that a good supervisor does is harnesses the strengths of an individual um, and 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 at the same time if an individual has a weakness, um, yeah, they could work on it and challenge them, but if it's something that's that's really is not is not working out then i think you know making modifications as needed and team group work could be very challenging and very stressful for the individual depending on you know but this could as i said this could be a growth opportunity that you could explore with them um so and i think i think the neurotypical individuals it's an opportunity for them to become educated about the challenges and contributions that the autistic person is is making so it's not only one way you know we as autistics spend a lot of effort and time and energy trying to understand how neurotypical or non-autistic culture and rules work so I think it's also important for for neurotypicals to to make an effort um, to to understand where we're at too. So kind of uh, fifty fifty. Okay. Uh, another question, Charlie. Uh, how can I help a coworker who is having a hard time advancing their library career? Uh, this is someone who's not comfortable disclosing their autism during or before the interview process. Hmm. Well, disclosure is totally up to that individual. You know, I mean, it, they, they, that is something that is in their control. And once you disclose, you can't take it back. So, you know, they have, they're perfectly uh, within their rights to not want to disclose. Um, but they're, it sounds like they're stagnating career wise. Um, uh, I would, I think maybe, um, it, I mean, it depends. It could be, it, it might not be a question. Uh, my first thought when you say, when, when the question was framed like that, I was thinking, well, maybe it's a question of their skills and their skills, they need to uh, learn new things and, and um, kind of be uh, more, have the skills that, uh, positions are asking for, but that might not be the issue. It might not be their skills. It might be how uh, they are interviewing on the phone and, you know, uh, in person. So uh, that that's a, that's a hard one. I mean, um, maybe talking to a job coach, um, 
maybe encouraging them to see a psychotherapist to give them tools to navigate uh, both personal and professional life. I know in my case, psychotherapy has been very, very, very helpful um, to give me tools that I can use in any situation. Um, you know, you could also, one thing I also wanted to mention to you all in Massachusetts is you have a wonderful resource called AANE. And uh, AANE is based in Watertown. Uh, a link to them is on my guide. And uh, they provide uh, in-person and online resources. They've been around since 1996. Um, and uh, it's, it stands for, it used to be the Asperger's Association of New England, but I think it's now the Asperger Autism Network. They kept the, they kept the acronym, but they changed what it meant after the DSM-5 change. Um, so AANE is a wonderful resource, and actually they have a conference coming up in October in Boston at Boston University with Tony Atwood, who's a, who is a wonderful uh, a practitioner and academic from Australia who I've been fortunate to see twice and in, in give lectures. Um, and he's coming to Boston in October. So um, if you have any interest in that, I would definitely encourage you to consider attending that. And he's the author of one of the books that I recommended on the LibGuide. Okay, so we'll, we'll get that info out to oh, you. Sorry, that was a very oh. long convoluted oh. answer. No, no worries there. Uh, we have another person asking if, if there's language in job descriptions that you think encourages or deters autistic applicants. Oh, that's a really good. That's a really good uh, point. Uh, not something that I've really thought about because I haven't really looked at the language of the requirements. Um, that would make a very good study, I think. Uh, for anyone looking for a research project, maybe. Um, yeah, some of the some of the emphasis, I think, just in a general sense, sometimes um, tend to we tend to emphasize, I guess you call them the soft skills. So like teamwork, good communicator. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff that's not really related to librarianship, but they'll throw it in, you know, in the job description. Um, positive attitude, uh, trying to think of other things that I've seen. So again, these are things that tend to be um, very social in nature and aren't necessarily directly related to the position. So is it really necessary? You know, um, I mean, I'm, and I'm not underestimating communication skills because that's important in a lot of jobs. I, I, I realize that, but um, for some individuals on the spectrum, that could be a problem. Uh, that could be a challenge, you know, so, um, yeah, but different jobs require different levels of communication, amounts of, you know, frequency. Of so, you know, I mean, it's dependent on the position, too. Okay, so we'll, we'll take one or two more questions since we are past one o'clock. Some folks are, are starting to uh, to sign off, but I, I do want to get a few, just a couple. Yes. Ways. Oh, yeah. I have I have uh, I have as much time as you need, really. So. Um, okay. <clears throat> Great. Um, so one person is asking, can you think of ways to educate patrons uh, about uh, social quirks of staff? So they have a, a great page who is on the spectrum library page who often scripts as he's working in the stacks, uh, which can sometimes be disturbing to those who aren't expecting it. So is there a way to educate scripts um, like I'm trying to think what that would mean, like talking to themselves? like talking through situations? I'm not sure, maybe they could clarify that if they're still here. Okay, so if you are still on, if you can clarify. Let's see, uh, another person asking, do you have any suggestions for staff on tactfully setting boundaries with another staff member who may be on the spectrum regarding questions and looking for reassurance? So how can they approach that in a tactful way? Um. So, so 
you just to rephrase that they're coming they're they're asking for too much reassurance and questions uh, I interpret that right Kelly I believe so yes um yeah that that is something that I got to be honest as an individual I am working on myself and uh they, they're, they're, there's not an easy answer. I think it, it, it takes time and focus and work to cultivate, and my therapist says it very well, um, you want to cultivate an internal locus of control. So instead of depending on external sources, i.e. other individuals to validate you, and and reassure you that you're on the right track and answer your questions even though you might know the answers but you want the confirmation you need to cultivate an internal locus of control so that you can start doing that yourself that is not something that is going to come quickly so um i wish i could give a more straightforward answer but i think that is the root of what uh, of, of probably this situation and the, the individual um, is, is probably, and I think it's a growing opportunity for them to work on, but it's going to take time um, to, to work with them on it. Um, but it, but it's, um, it's something that, that I am actively working on. And I think it's very challenging in the moment to do it. I can I can say, you know, um, I can say, oh, I I can I can validate that in a in a very uh, abstract sense. But when I'm in a situation, my natural tendency is to want that external validation and reassurance. And so breaking that and relying more on myself is very hard. And it's something that I'm actively working on. But at least I would say the good thing is that at least I'm aware of it thanks to a therapist, okay? I was not aware of it before, but she kind of filled in the blanks and gave me the picture uh, of seeing something uh, from another's perspective. And, and now that I understand it, and I'm working on it the next step. And, and you know, realistically, it might be something that I might have to continue to work on for the rest of my life. It might not be something that I will ever fully, um, it, it might not come first nature. So, yeah. Okay. So, Charlie, we do have clarification on that earlier question. Oh, good, uh, the, yes. The library page who's doing scripting. And yep. so that is that he repeats movie dialogue or reenacts stories out loud uh, while doing his work in the stacks. For example, uh, repeating Harry Potter dialogue. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, and you're wondering whether how you can explain uh, that to other patrons? or yes, staff yes, members. That was the question, how to, how to yeah, maybe... I mean, it might actually be, and I could be wrong, um, but it, it might be a way for that individual to lower their anxiety level. Um, it might help them focus. Um, so I think maybe finding, maybe finding out why they do it, if, if that, or maybe they don't know why they do it and they just do it because they've done it and it's just something that they do. Maybe that's the case. Um, but I, I, do, I do think it is probably number one, a special interest. So they're probably interested in that topic that they're, they're you, you mentioned and they're repeating it over and over because they're very, very interested. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, it might be a stress reduction technique. So maybe, Maybe try to ascertain whether they are um, anxious um, and maybe work with them on some um, skills to uh, lessen, lessen their anxiety. And that might, um, at the same time, you could also, you know, explain to the, the colleagues um, once you ascertain the situation better what's going on. Okay, so speaking of stress, uh, another person says, we have a lot of student workers and some work four or more hours. Do you think it would be better to limit the work hours of a student on the spectrum? Uh, oh, yes. To help with stress? Uh, yes, I would. I would. Um, I think 
personally, from my own perspective, I definitely limited the amount of hours that I worked during undergrad and grad um, very deliberately because I get overwhelmed very easily, I get anxious very easily, and it's challenging for me to balance competing priorities. And when I was a student, my sole biggest priority was my education, was my classes, were my readings, studying, working on projects. So, uh, and and I think that that is, you know, um, that's why they're there. Um, so yes, I would definitely, uh, in my own experience, when I was going through school and working, I would definitely limit my hours um, so that I wouldn't I wouldn't feel uh, overwhelmed. Um, and you know, a lot of people have this idea that oh, you work in the library, you can study there. Um, while you're working. And number one, it depends on the job you have in the library. If you're helping out in tech services and you're shelving and processing new books, you're not going to have time to study. But also, if you're at a public service point helping people and you uh, like at the checkout desk, right? And you get easily distracted by sensitive, sens sensory. Um, uh, stimuli coming at you, you're probably not going to really study well. I know I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to retain what I read because I would be so, um, I just don't transition well bet and multitask well between between things. So, um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, going on the academic library theme, someone is asking, uh, have you seen or are you aware of any academic libraries that you feel are doing a good job on services for autistics? And if so, can you can you share examples of that? Um, you know, not not off the top of my head. I mean, I I don't um, I, I think one of the one of the challenges is the literature is still very limited um, on um, academic libraries serving autistics and so I mean they could be doing it but they might not be writing about it or presenting on it and so I think it's definitely improving I mean there are people who are you know doing PhD dissertations on the topic and um, you know and that's really exciting um, and so my point is I think that that um, more needs to be written about these these successes um, and and hopefully that that will happen. Okay, so Charlie, we have an early childhood educator who is working in the children's department at a library, and uh, in in their classroom uh, they had used something called conscious discipline for children, which worked very well. Um, this person's wondering if you're familiar with conscious no. discipline, which no, nope. apparently is highly recommended. Mm, uh, no, never heard of it. Okay, okay. Conscious discipline. I'll write that down. Okay. Uh, we're starting to get a lot of uh, thank yous in and that sort of thing, so this may be a good indication that we can wrap up today. For those sure. who have continuing questions, uh, we do hope that you will take those to the Facebook group, right? Um, yep, or email me if you're not on Facebook and you know ask them there. It's totally um, whatever works best, but yeah, and I want to thank everyone for their great questions. I mean, you all really, um, you know, showed a, a real genuine level of interest and engagement, and, and I really appreciate that, and, um, you know, thank you for making an effort to attend and learn more about this topic, and um, I really, I, I appreciate your interest. And uh, on behalf of MLS, I, I also want to thank the attendees, and I want to thank you, Charlie, for sharing your, your knowledge and your perspective with us today. Uh, uh, you're just, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity, Kelly. I really appreciate it. Okay, great. Just a quick reminder, we will be sending a follow-up message. It will have the recording of today's webinar as well as a link to the LibGuide. We'll try and add a lot of the resources that you all have shared in the chat, add to that guide as well. So watch for that. Hopefully